question time. <laughs> <laughs> you can be, do you want to be right wing and I'll be left wing? Okay. <laughs> you, you can go first. <laughs> and I'll just back you up the whole way. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'll put my foot in it. <laughs> well, that's why you're going first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I say anything, I shouldn't. Be, I'll make sure I yeah. cut it out. Okay, so please introduce yourselves and tell the viewers your roles within the Star Wars universe. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Um, my name is Paul Casey, and I played Eloasti on The Force Awakens, um, Admiral Radis on Rogue One, and Kyther Nally on The Last Jedi. Uh, my name is Aidan Cook. Uh, on Force Awakens, I was Boba Joe, and uh, have Nade in Villager, Ilko Woodica, and uh, Strono Cookie Tugs. And a couple of other bits and pieces. <laughs> <coughs> Force Awakens, my main claim to fame is Ben Big Two Tubes, and uh, what was the other one? The, the Last Jedi, uh, an assortment of creatures, uh, including including a, a turkey. <laughs> um, uh, a bit of a sea cow. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I can't remember actually or four bits and pieces but no, nothing sort of very featured on that one so he's trying to get more yes. names of characters yes. in yeah. Yeah. yeah he's more than welcome <laughs> more than welcome so, um, so I'm not sure you may need to press pause because I think you said The Force Awakens Ben Thick. oh did I not remember oh that? that's fine everybody knows it's Rogue okay <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, so were you both fans of the original Star Wars trilogy before you got your roles in the recent movies um, as a child, I remember Star Wars. I think as working on Star Wars and on the, on the films I've worked on, I've become more of a fan. Mm. I think it's just opened my eyes up to this sort of massive universe. I remember the original films and the excitement of them, but I think the, the actual sort of madness of the whole uh, the size of the fan universe, I wasn't really aware of. It's huge. Until, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's gargantuan, huge. you know, when you start. You work on Doctor Who, and I've done conventions and things for Doctor Who, and I thought that was big, you know, and then suddenly you, you dip your toe into the Star Wars universe, and it's actually it's gargantuan. I mean, you actually can't really get your head around the size of it and the, the passion for it. And, uh, yeah, to be involved in that is a, is a huge sort of privilege and honour, really. So what was your most memorable moment working on the uh, Star Wars movies so far? Um, for me, I would have to turn the clock back to The Force Awakens, and I just think, mm. I'm not sure what you think, but for me, I think when we went out to Abu Dhabi and we were on the Salt Flats, mm. and we were out there as you know the CFX department and the team mm. and just working together out there, it was a very, very special moment for yeah. me, I think. It was the start of an amazing period of time mm. for all of us, and all of us are part of the Star Wars world, basically, yeah. universe. I think the, <clears throat> the actual moment, I mean, we'd, we'd been working in Pinewood rehearsing creatures like the Hathor and things like that, and, and then the actual moment, JJ says, well, here we are, and we're just about to turn over on the first shot of this film. And the, the, there was an extraordinary sense of excitement, and not least of which, when we drove out there, you'd drive out of um, Abu Dhabi and off to the salt flats into the desert, and you thought you were going into the middle of nowhere, and then in the middle of nowhere was this whole town really it was it was like a massive military campaign you know the, the amount that the, the the all the different departments were there the amount of machinery that was there and then you walked on to set and you saw this thing where they were going to start any event it and, uh, yeah it was yeah the sense of excitement was was absolutely palpable you know and uh, and i think the next time i felt that <clears throat> moment was they showed we, we were invited in to see some clips that from Abu Dhabi that we'd done in, one, in yeah. one of the studios at Pinewood yeah. and they'd dropped the scene and they were you know and it was a treat and you the music started kicking in and you know like this and then they showed these shots and they showed the Millennium Falcon taking off like and, and it was just to be to realize that you were part of that was amazing really. you know it, it, it was uh, you realize how lucky you are actually not not least with just that you're in and that you're actor and that you're working but that you're in something which is known literally universally you know so uh, yeah so it's a it's a nice nice to have that place great you both seem to play a lot of uh, monsters or alien characters in both movies and tv how did that come about uh, i'll start yeah um 
Well, for me, I used to do a lot of uh, children's TV uh, things and work. I had a program which I presented, a couple of programs I presented, BBC and uh, Channel 4. And then there was a move that started really with tweenies and uh, programs like tweenies and fimbles where you would have characters with animatronic heads and because of the work I'd already done I was employed to do some of the voices and then uh, for purposes of um, I don't know economy they would like the voices to actually operate the animatronics on the head as well to get the lip sync and that because you knew the way that you did your own phrasing how you would phrase your voice you would they were happy for you to operate the animatronics so I was part of that world before I actually got into a skin. And then um, I was uh, auditioned for Hellboy 2, uh, again to actually be a character on it and got into that uh, as the uh, uh, two-headed troll, which is the one with the tumour baby. And that gave me my introduction to being inside skins and uh, just kind of rolled on from there really, went from there. You get a, I suppose you get a bit of a reputation for being able to to put up with it. A lot of it is putting up with all the difficulties of being in a suit, not being able to see, not being able to breathe. Um, you know, the exertions of being in a suit are actually can be you know, quite significant. So to be able to put up with all of that and follow directions and act and hit your marks and all of those sorts of things, I seem to have a bit of a disposition because of a background in dance and movement. <coughs> and uh, it kind of went on from there. I think you went it's a, a bit of a niche area and people know you do it they're likely to come and look for you so so, so I, I was quite similar actually I trained at Lane Theatre Arts so I trained in singing dancing acting I could also do the gymnastics and I was also a little bit of a contortionist as well so for many many years I sort of worked in that field <clears throat> I was in the West End I was in a West End show called Fosse um, which was a tribute to Bob Fosse and all his amazing choreography and his work, where I auditioned for a film. Um, at the time, I wasn't sure what the film was, but I did the audition. Um, it happened to be for Guillermo del Toro, and it was Blade II. Um, so that was my first introduction to the world of prosthetics, sitting in a chair for four hours, having my makeup put on. But I just found it a truly, truly amazing world, the film, film world. That was filmed out in Prague. I think I was there for about 15 weeks filming on and off. Um, and from there, sort of my world just started to change really. I came back, I had a meeting with Danny Boyle. I went on to 28 Days Later, uh, the sort of zombie film. Um, and not long after that, I then auditioned for um, Doctor Who. Um, I auditioned for Elsa Burke, who's the movement choreographer on Doctor Who, and did about, I think nine series of Doctor Who, along with Torchwood, the Sarah Jane Adventures, being human. So in the world of aliens, creatures, monsters, suit work, um, animatronics, prosthetics, I mean, you name it, that was, became my world, really. Um, I think in having the background of movement, um, choreography and dance, um, that has enabled me and helped me in the world of Star Wars, really. I'm the creature effects movement choreographer along with playing um, characters in suits as well, as we well know. So that's sort of a rough idea of how I got into mm. the sort of creature world. Um, but primarily it's because of the movement side of it. And like Aidan was saying, you know, where suit work, it's always challenging, you know, every day is a challenge. But nevertheless, it's a challenge we all rise to and we all truly love what we do mm. on a day-to-day day -day basis. So, um, I mean, yeah. from, from our point of view, being inside it, having you find that you know, the, the directors, the first ADs, they don't really have any understanding of what it is being in the, inside a creature. And, and certainly in film, I mean, in TV, you could say, right, this, you, you're inside a head, that's a head up, that's 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, the head comes off, you get a rest, and they can schedule it like that. They can't do that on films. There's just uh, too many other departments that are trying to get their act together and for everything to be working at exactly the right time. So to actually have somebody like Paul, who has so much experience in the suits, who's actually on, you know, he's, if he's not in the suit, he's standing next to the director or the first AD, and he's directing us, you know, to, in, straight into our ear. And he understands what it is that we actually have to go through to, to be able to achieve what they're asking for. And that's, that's enormously important for us, because otherwise you, you they, sometimes, they, I mean, for example, I do quite a lot of primate stuff. I do, you know, orangutans and stuff. And I've been in in the, 
cabin in the jungle in Thailand, you know, dressed in a big fur suit and, and things like this. And the first AD comes up and talks to your minder while there's patting your head and stroking <laughs> your tummy and stuff, and that they literally forget that there's somebody in there, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Or if, you, you know, if your creature's got an eye over here, they'll be di- talking to the eye up there, you know, and you can't hear anyway because you've got headphones in, so you have one headphone for the dialogue and one for your puppeteer, you know. So it's, it's a very, uh, inside there, it's a very isolated world, you know, yeah, and, and, that, and, and, uh, and, and, and the trick is, you know, to have an internal choreography in terms of your movement, so you know how far to move, when to move, the degree of movement. You know, you, you know, direct turn. You know, you turn forty-five degrees. You, you have to have a, a an internal compass, don't you? Yeah. yeah. And, and all of those. It's it's a it's a it's a very interesting world that where you have to make it all look as like dancers make it look effortless. And, and as and natural yes, as possible. As, yes. I yeah. remember very early on yeah. when I was playing the creatures, like sort of on Blade, really, and. Even though you look so alien, you know, my thought was you just have to make it, or my job is to make it look as natural as possible. Mm -hmm. So to the human eye, you would believe it. And from then on, all the stuff I've done, I think about that every day, truly every day. No matter what you're wearing or what you're being asked to do, make it look as natural as possible. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It has yeah. to be. It has to be real for you. I mean, I learned this from children's stuff. I, yeah, when I was doing children's TV, I had the sort of directors and that saying, "Oh, it doesn't matter. It's just kids." And I say, "No. If 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 it's not real to me, it's not going to be real to them." And it's exactly the same now. Whatever creature you're in, you have to have a reality for it. You, yeah. no, no matter how fantastic it is, if if you think you if if you're not actually being it. If you're just playing it rather than being it, it, it doesn't work for, to no. my mind. No. You know, so so I think all of those those skills that you've learned in other places, all the movement stuff, and all for me, all the sort of children's theatre stuff and that, that I did. I think they all they all feed into what we're doing now. Yeah. Great, That's brilliant responses. <laughs> uh, particularly with *The Force Awakens*, did you get the opportunity to spend time with any of the original trilogy cast uh, on or off camera? And are you still in touch with any of them? Yeah, I mean, on a day-to-day yes. basis, when yes. we would do those scenes yes. with sort of Anthony Daniels and yes. Harrison Ford, yeah. I mean, or, you know, all of the, the trilogy characters mm-hmm. that, you know, you are there and you're working yes. with them. But quite often, you're, there's so much in your world that you're dealing with and having to sort out, if you mm-hmm. see what I mean, that you are literally doing your job. But nevertheless, there are those periods of time yeah. when you're walking off set or on set and, you know, yeah, there they, are those yeah, they tend comments. To be, and they tend to, well, they have, they have a, you know, their own minders, you know, and stuff like that. And they, they will come on to do a scene and they will rehearse scenes and things like that. So there are moments where you, where you will kind of interact with them. But they, 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 they are, for, from my point of view, they, first of all, you can be very isolated. Like when I, when I was doing Hellboy, you know, you get there at four o'clock in the morning and start doing the makeup. By the time, you know, um, other people arrive on set, they've got no idea who you look like, you know. <laughs> you, can see, can you go and see yeah. them, and then you go and say, oh, hi, how are you, out of costume? And they think you're some weirdo, you know, like some groupie that's going that up. That happens quite a lot. Yes, it does, yeah. So, well, I did it anyway, that's yeah. <laughs> um, but, they, uh, but, but, but But there is, there is that too, that you are, you know, you, within the department, you they quite often they don't actually know who's in the head. Like I said, when you go on set to, with JJ, he's absolutely brilliant at remembering who you are and and that. So you can go on there, you'll walk onto set with your head on, and his first question will be, "Who you got? In there? Who have we got in here today?" So it's oh, it's Aiden. Ah, great, Aiden. Welcome back. Okay, come over here and do this. And and he's brilliant at making you feel really, really included. Some of them are less so. Some of them don't know you from Adam, but then. You know, that's just the. It is definitely different departments. You know, like yeah. that. But but in terms of the the principles, I mean, they've all they're always friendly and accessible and that. But I, I tend not to be in the same um, area of. Uh, uh, you know, just I wouldn't go out drinking with them. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, they wouldn't come drinking with me. <laughs> <laughs> or oh, awkward. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, which is your favourite Star Wars universe character you've played so far, and why? A favourite. I find this a difficult question to answer, only in the sense that they're all amazing and they're all the best, but for different reasons, really. Um, but I suppose up till now, to choose one, it would possibly have to be Admiral Radus. I mean, he's a Mon Calamari for a start. I mean, he's got such a back, or his species has such a back history. Um, he, you know, he's quite a big part of the end of Rogue One and the whole battle bit at the end. So, 
Yeah, I mean, I suppose in terms of size of character and things like that, I would probably say personally for me it would be Admiral Radis. Yeah, I think for me there's a couple. I think one that's really special to me is Boba Joe, partly because it was the very first of this new generation of creatures that were seen. Uh, we were out in Abu Dhabi and JJ was doing this thing of force for good and he was doing a piece to camera and he asked me, he was going to do this at lunchtime, if I would just walk across behind him while he was doing the I piece to camera. I remember seeing it, yeah. And so that was the very first one that was seen and then when we got back uh, I was invited to take it out to um, San Diego Comic Con and basically walk across the stage while they were doing the panel with him and that was, we were talking earlier about realising the size of the of this whole Star Wars universe and that was where it really, really hit home and, and so that being the first one and it being sort of so special that that, that was good for me and uh, other than that I think Ben Thick Two Tubes again it was uh, really unexpected that, uh, that the, it came out almost out of nowhere within the film, I wasn't expecting it to be anything at the time we were called, it was called Two Tubes by the department because it's got two tubes coming out of it. It didn't really kind of have a name. And then suddenly I was involved with Saw Gerrera and, um, you know, it, it, it sort of has become a much more sort of feature character. And it's also, there's no animatronics. I can see where I'm going. I can breathe <laughs> relatively easily. It's quite comfortable. I've got nice comfortable shoes. And so it's actually a real pleasure to play. <laughs> comfortable shoes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> So do you follow any of the Star Wars Expanded Universe in any way, for example, the, the games, the books, the comics? Um, I get to hear an awful lot mm. about a lot of things, um, but I don't actually follow them myself, personally. And I th think for me, I've just sort of recently reintroduced to the comics, definitely, because um, Two Tubes has got a nice story like it. <laughs> <Two Tubes. laughs> and it appears he survived the conflagration or Jedi, so I'm in good shape. <laughs> so, yes, uh, comics are definitely uh, a, a world I'm looking more into now than I was previously. You've also both played many characters in the Doctor Who universe. Which was your favourite to work on and why? Um, wow. That's another difficult one. I think to have to choose, I would go Cyberman. Classic. Absolutely, <laughs> because he's such a classic. Yeah. And, um, you know, for them to have come back um, and for, you know, myself to have played one was, you know, was pretty special, um, a special time. Um, but nevertheless, I think if I had the time, I would probably end up choosing every character mm -hmm. I've played yeah. for all different reasons. Yeah. But yeah, to choose one, I think Simon. Yeah. What about yourself, Adrian? Well, I was really lucky. We did. Uh, um, I was played the first of the new generation Cybermen um, in Nightmare in Silver, and I also got to play the very last of Paul's generation because there was a chess playing Cyberman in there as well. So it was, it was supposed to be an automaton. So I got to play the last of Paul's generation and the first of the new generation. So, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, one of my favourite, probably my favourite, we, we, we did um, uh, the Zygons together, and, yeah. and actually that was that was the fiftieth special. That was the fiftieth special, was yeah. And, and actually, that was just so much fun. That was. It was. We had much more fun than we should have had, you know. So, but doing the in rubber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in rubber. Uh, but most, the most interesting one I did was one called the Crooked Man. Uh, and uh, the reason that was interesting was that I was working with Elsa Burke again. In terms of the movement, this this creature was all crooked. I had uh, arm extensions which were sort of off at different angles, and 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 the whole thing was to make the movement look really quirky. And in order to aid making the movement really quirky, I did everything backwards. So they filmed it all backwards and then nice. ran it forward again. And the biggest compliment I was was a complaint that the BBC got for saying, why are you using digital creatures you know, like this? You know, because the movement was so weird and quirky that it didn't look real anymore like this. So, uh, but uh, th that one I really enjoyed. I, I, I loved not just being another humanoid with a different forehead. It was, it was really nice to do something that was much more uh, challenging. You know, so. Great. Mm. Uh, do either of you have a part to play in the new Han Solo movie? Um, can you tell us the characters? Um, no. <laughs> um, you'll have to wait till May to see if I've played anything. 
Aidan, you're going to give us a different answer? He, he said no. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> the man from Del Monte. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll skip that one. Uh, do you enjoy doing conventions and meeting your fans? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Without a question. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. thing is, we wouldn't be there without the fans, without all you guys. No, and, and that's actually... Yeah, no, it is. It, it's a real pleasure to actually see this. It, it's odd, really, because uh, you don't. I, it, 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 sometimes I feel a little bit ambivalent because I don't want to feel that I'm exploiting anybody, uh, you know. Uh, but at the same time, it does seem to mean a lot to people, and that's really, really lovely to be able to sort of meet people and chat with them and, and not tell them what we're doing at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice because, um, you know, sort of at, at an event or a convention, yeah. you get to do a QA. And quite often you're asked questions that people don't know. And the, the only way they would know is if they're there at that mm. Q&A and they're actually hearing it from you sure. and our experience and what we, you know, what yeah. we go through on a day-to-day -day mm. basis. Yeah. And so it's very special in that way, you know, but it's very special to meet all the fans. And yeah. I mean, there are all levels of fans, you know, um, but they're always a pleasure to meet. And, um, yeah. yeah, you get some very, very unlikely people that you know that you just would never expect to be found you know and, and then it sort of comes out in conversation that you're doing that and 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 it, suddenly you you hit them at another level that you know it's a it's a shortcut <coughs> isn't it really in, into uh, a lot of people do you remember uh, well paul and i both have, have played foxy on foxy bingo and and it turned out i didn't know but it turned out that the, that the director was he's got a tardis in the garden <laughs> <laughs> You know, it sort of comes out and go, oh, um, yes, I did that. He went, what? You know, it's like, so, so it's probably why we got the job, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Mind you, we can dance. We, yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> we can both dance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, in which case, have you got any appearances coming up uh, this year where your fans can, can kind of meet, meet you? Um, hopefully, I'm doing Philadelphia, uh, schedule permitting, um, and hopefully Burnley as well. Um, yeah. Is that near Philadelphia? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have one in uh, it's my first proper Star Wars convention that, that I've done and that's going to be in a place called Cousset near Paris or just outside Paris and that's at the end of April April 30th, 31st I think Yeah. So and that will be my uh, first I've done uh, conventions with Doctor Who but this will be my first Star Wars one Brilliant, well uh, both thank you for signing today, it's been a pleasure Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>